Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Today's discussion is not meant to be polemical, meaning it's not an argument from one side to the other. Obviously, I'm going to be presenting two major opinions in the Muslim world today about uh, about how to move forward. And to understand that, you have to first get an introduction to the idea called Maqasid al-Sharia. Because this idea of Maqasid al-Sharia is being used in different ways by different scholars. And we have to be aware of this because we have to understand how this idea is going to impact us. So the question we'll be looking at, and the question that Sheikh Yusuf Qardawi and Sheikh Hamza Yusuf both have looked at using the Maqasid al-Sharia is the question of obedience to the current status quo versus we have to work to change the status quo. Okay, so the question is, do we accept things as they are? Sheikh Hamza Yusuf very, very strongly believes we need to accept the reality. This is fiqh al waqir This is the reality. The reality of the situation is this is what we're dealing with, is what we have. And then the other scholars are like, no, what we have is not right. It needs to be changed. And so we're going to look at what are the tools that are being used to make these arguments and uh, and, and, and the tool that's mostly being used is called Maqasid al-Sharia. Imam Shatabi's idea of, uh, of Maqasid al-Sharia. Sheikh Yusuf Qardawi has written quite a few books on the issue. She's, he's written one specific book on the issue. I need to introduce the subject to you. After I introduce the subject for you, to you, you will be able to appreciate the importance of the subject. And the reality is also, now I'm saying this is the reality, this is my statement, but that this is the direction, the general direction in which Islamic scholarship is also moving in. So we have to, whether one agrees with it or how much one agrees with it, uh, one has to uh, deal with the issue of Maqafid al-Sharia if you're going to have a dialogue with Muslim scholars that are of repute. Uh, Muslim scholars who have a say, who Muslim scholars who are thinking seriously about the situation around us, okay, and so, okay, so Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Now the Maqasid al-Sharia basically deals with the why. So, for example, Quran says Khamar is haram, alcohol is haram. Now that's the text. The text says alcohol is haram. But now, if I start saying, if I, let's say there's a judge and there are two lawyers and some, somebody did cocaine, somebody did heroin, he took, took some strong drug, um, now he took some psychedelic drugs or something that made his brain go crazy. Now there are two lawyers. The lawyer that has this client that took these drugs says to me, look, he took these drugs, but these drugs, you can't punish him. Because these drugs are not mentioned in Quran, nor they are mentioned by the Prophet And this is the argument that he gives me. And he's like, how dare you, you know, how dare we, rather, try to say something is haram that the Quran does not directly call haram. The other lawyer comes to me and says, or the prosecution witness, or the prosecu prosecutor on behalf of the government, who is now has a case against this uh, citizen, okay, who took these drugs. He says to me, look, alcohol is haram, we know that, but this has the same impact uh, in, in so many different ways as alcohol does, and it is just as bad as alcohol, and so therefore it should be, it, there should be the same punishment. Great. Which way will the judge go? Which way do, does, should the judge go? So there was this idea that uh, the Qur'an talks about a specific instance, but this specific instance, this very specific instance now can be generalized, okay, as something that causes this type of harm and has this type of effect on your brain, then can now be applied to anything that has that type of effect on your brain. And so now we find the idea of Qiyas coming to the same conclusion that the saying of the Prophet وسلم, that any, any, any intoxicant is, uh, has the same hukum as alcohol, is all haram. Now let me ask you another question. I'm going to ask you two questions. 
Very basic questions, but you'll get the idea. Uh, a cappella, I think, is the word that's used for when you make music from your mouth, but it sounds like other instruments. So let's say somebody does music in a cappella. Is that now one lawyer comes to the judge, and even though in Islam we don't have this like two way lawyer style generally, but let's say, you know, there's a judge. And there are two people arguing. One says, look, the Quran makes clear that the flute is haram, or I wouldn't say the word haram, but extremely, extremely disliked. It's sinful, absolutely sinful. The string instruments are absolutely sinful. And uh, uh, by the way, about the word haram, let me just very simply mention, the word haram is a very big word. And we use the word haram for any sin. Legally, this is not correct. Correct. It's not correct Quranically. It's not correct because Allah says, "Don't make haram what Allah made didn't make haram." This is clear in Quran, right? And uh, so, haram is a category of sin like murder. Haram is a category of sin like drinking alcohol. Haram is like a category of sin like eating pork, or doing magic, or doing shirk with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. These types of things are haram. Right, the things that are under that. Now, the problem that Muslims have sometimes is because if something's not haram, we're like, "Oh, it's not haram, we can do it." That's not true. Your spiritual life runs on a totally different set of rules than your legal life. Legally, you're not required to have a beard. It's not fard to have a beard, but does that mean you won't have a beard because it's not fard? No, that's not the proper attitude. In the same way, it's not the proper attitude just because something is disliked or makru or makru tahrimi or makru tahlini. It doesn't mean that you should go near those things. They're still sinful and you will still be accountable and you'll be still punished. Haram is a higher category of punishment. Okay. You'll be punished for the small sins if you didn't do tawbah. But you'll be also punished for the big sins if you didn't do tawbah. Anyway, so let's go back to the legal aspect of Islam. So, somebody does a cappella. Now there are two people arguing. One person says, one lawyer says to the judge, Look, the Prophet did not, the Prophet mentioned specific instruments. They are disliked or haram or however you would like to categorize it. But he's doing this with his mouth. This is totally different. This has nothing to do with the flute. This has nothing to do with string instruments. And now another lawyer comes and says, Look, the spirit of the law is such that these instruments have these type of effects upon the brain, the serotonin, and so on and so forth. That, that type of environment, that type of music creates a certain mood. And because it sounds like that, even though it is not that, it should fall into the same category, whether it is a cappella or not. I'll let you guys decide. But the point is that we're not only we are we are looking at the why why is something haram like in the case of alcohol and drugs but we're also looking at the spirit what is the purpose what is the spirit of this right uh, i'll give you another example let's say that as far as human beings can determine the reason a pig is haram is because it churns food only for four hours Versus a cow, which is a halal animal, and it churns its food for 24 hours. A pig has no sweat glands, so the toxins can't come out. Whereas a cow has sweat glands, and all the toxins come out. And, you know, the pig has a behavior where it eats poop, it eats its dead, it eats like anything. And it just has very bad behavior. But now let's suppose I genetically manipulate pigs where they're going to churn the food, food really well. They're going to churn the food exactly like cows, okay, for 24 hours. They're going to eat grass just like the cow. They're not going to eat, they're not going to do any misbehavior or inappropriate behaviors. They're going to be just as decent and docile and, and just as submissive as cows, so to say. And, you know, we're, we're going to take everything and genetically manip manipulate the the pig to basically be as close as possible to the animals that are halal to eat. And so now instead of the pig uh, eating what it normally eats, it'll eat grass, it'll churn the food for 24 hours, it'll have sweat glands, it'll let all the toxins out. And so 
You know, and, and, and it, like a cow has more than one stomach. I think it has four stomachs or three stomachs. I don't remember right now. But uh, we'll put on three or four stomachs into this pig too. So it really churns the food well. Okay. Now, now that I've genetically manipulated this pig, is the pig haram because there's something wrong with it, like at the gene level, at, 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 at the level of its essence? Or is it is something wrong with the pig because of its behavior, because of what it does, and because of what it, uh, you know, because of, of, of certain aspects of it? Now, the reason I mention this is that Maqasid al Sharia gives you the tools to try to understand and deal with situations like this. All right? So now, uh, so I can ask you guys the question. So, you know, if there's a pig, and you genetically manipulate it and remove all the bad things. Let's suppose we came to a conclusion, these are the bad things about the pig. If you are able to come to the conclusion, this is what's bad about alcohol and therefore other drugs should be haram, then it could be said by the ideas of Imam Ibn Qayyim, by the ideas of Imam Shatabi, and by the ideas of many other scholars of Islam, that if we can do that, if we can say this is haram for this reason, then we can broaden it to other things that are, come within the same category, okay? If we can figure out why a pig is haram, and you know, one of my teachers, uh, Sheikh Ahmed Mustafa, who lives in Philadelphia, uh, he, he taught me for a very short period of time, but, but what he taught me was very significant. And he said that there are two types of attitudes towards the Sharia. One is the people that submit they just submit. You know, this is the reason that the, the Islam came to submit and the Prophet said it and do it. Don't ask questions, just do it. And then there are the people that look for the maqasid. Qasad al-Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Umar bin Khattab was very much like the person, which is why he made so many ijtihads uh, and put the Quran in the form of a book and so many other things Umar bin Khattab did. But the reason was because he was always looking at the, what was the intent? Aisha was the same way, very much the same way. You know, and so she wasn't satisfied with the Prophet just said this. She always wanted to know, okay, what's the reason? Now, when you are dealing with the world out large there, and there's so many different types of cases and new things are coming up, it all, almost becomes inevitable that you have to deal with the why. Very much like, let me give you this example. Uh, if there is a red light and you stop at a red light, let's say at 2 o'clock in the morning, and there's absolutely no traffic, and the red light stopping you from moving for the next 3-4 minutes, should you stop? Should you be made to stop? Or could you like look in all directions and you just say, forget about the rule, I'm not going to obey it because it doesn't apply here, and you move on? If you do this one time, does this affect the other times? that you know Will this become like a habit, and then this habit eventually lead to let's say, at a mass level, accidents. Um, so this is kind of like, do you, you have to determine the why in order to be able to apply it at other levels in society that are not mentioned in the Quran, in the Sunnah of the Prophet Okay? So, okay, so that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is, so, so we have to understand this why. So now Imam Shatabi and what is agreed upon by the Muslims. And now we're going to, now that you kind of understand that what we're looking at, we're looking at the why. Okay. And so the why came to five things. The Sharia wants to protect five things. Sharia wants to, and one great uh, Muslim political scientist uh, came to the conclusion that, you know, our jihad is for these five things. Right, and that is essentially correct. Okay, so what are the five things the Sharia wants to protect? The Sharia wants to, number one, protect your Iman, whether you're Christian, Jew, Muslim, Parsi, or uh, in any, any type of Muslim, whatever your Iman is, Quran wants to protect that. Number one. Number two, Quran wants to protect your Aql. That's why you're not allowed alcohol and drugs and so on and so forth. This is the intent, this is the purpose of what Sharia is. This is what Sharia is trying to do. It is trying to protect your aql. Aql is sacred, okay? Your deen is sacred. 
protection of the monks and the rabbis is sacred within Sharia. That's why they're called dhimmi. Dhimmi means the people that we take responsibility, special responsibility, uh, to take care of the people of other faiths because their faith is sacred. This is why the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whoever hurt a dhimmi, I will argue against that Muslim who hurt a dhimmi, I will argue against him on the Day of Judgment. It's sacred. Sacred number one, Iman. Number two, your aql. Number three, your mal, your wealth. This is why the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Man qatala duna mali fa huwa shaheed. Whoever dies protecting his wealth, he's shaheed. Number four, your nasab, your genes. This is why when you adopt a son, you cannot give your name to that son that you adopted. You have to tell the son that this is your, this is his right, this is his sacred right, that you have to maintain the nasab, have to maintain the genes, and this can lead, lead into a lot of discussions about genetics and all of that too, which I'm not going to do right now. I'm just going over the very, very basics. So the protection of the the nasab, okay? And number five, the protection of life. Like the Prophet said in Hajjat al wuda right? Uh, that today your dama'ukum uh, wa amwalukum haramun alaykum ka yawmikum hadha wa baladikum hadha wa shahrikum hadha. Today your blood, in, in, in another hadith, a'radikum, your honor, your blood, your life is sacred today, the Prophet said, like this land of Mecca, in the month of the Hijjah, in, you know, so in, in this, in these days of uh, the Hijjah, okay, so, <clears throat> uh, on this day, uh, the Prophet said, anyway, so these are the five things Sharia wants to protect. It wants to protect your life, your deen, your aql, your nasab, and your mal. These are the things that are agreed upon basically across the board. Okay, there's been no disagreement. They, people have added things to it, which is what we are now going to discuss. What did Sheikh Yusuf Qardawi add to this? And I will talk about what some other people maybe added to this. For example, I'll just quickly mention uh, Sheikh La Sultan, who is now in jail in Egypt, uh, he was also a teacher of mine for a short period of time, a uh, very short period of time. But uh, but he said something interesting. He said, Sharia wants to protect family life. This is one of the maqasas of Sharia. This is one of the purposes and intents of Sharia. Sharia wants to maintain the family structure, the family values. The This is the purpose of Sharia. This is why Sharia came. Okay. So uh, looking at all the rules regarding marriage and divorce and what Quran, what is Quran particularly specifically trying to promote so you can find the maqasid within the quran itself okay now one of them is family life family family and family life okay now i will start with sheikh hamza yusuf what he is saying is look fiqhul waqia is the reality is that we have these institutions the idea that overthrow all this, overthrow all these institutions and come up with a new world that's too idealistic, it's not going to happen, it is impractical, so we have to deal with what we have, number one. And number two, this is the only way to protect your life, your aql, your nasab, your wealth, and your, uh, your which one is the, in your iman. This is the way to protect these five maqasids of Sharia. That is that you have to work with the system as it is. The idea of overthrowing the leaders, and I'll talk about this in a second. The idea of overthrowing the leaders means more chaos, more civil war. Look at Syria, look at Egypt, look at all the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring, Spring has proven the idea of overthrowing the leaders and trying to bring something new is impractical. It's not going to work. And... Human life is sacred, our aql is sacred, our iman is sacred. We have to work within the system as it is today and just think that we're going to come up with a new system, a new idea, a, a new, like we're going to overthrow what's already there. We're going to overthrow what is already there and bring something new. This is too idealistic. And let me also add on behalf of Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, we don't really see our predecessors in the 
uh, the Khilafah of the, uh, you know, we don't see our predecessors really doing this, especially after the Umayyad Empire. From the Abbasid Empire to the Ottoman Empire to the Mughal Empire, basically all these different empires, they didn't, the ulama didn't really support uh, kind of like a rebellion or a turnover of, 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 of the leadership. And the Prophet told us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to be patient over your leaders if you don't like them. And so this is the situation we're in. This is the reality. We don't have great leaders, but you have to work with them, right? And, uh, and, and so then, therefore, I support the status quo because I think there will be more benefit that will come from protecting or help or being with the status quo than trying to overthrow something or bringing a new paradigm, a new society, a new paradigm shift that is just too idealistic, okay? And which Sheikh Hamza Yusuf calls kind of like a Marxist idea, okay? Now, let me make this even more difficult. What does... So here, Sheikh Yusuf Qardawi is adding something to the Maqasid the sharia which is that in order to protect these five things, you need stability. You need stability, you need stability before you need justice. Now remember this, because this is an exact turnover of what Sheikh Yusuf Qardawi is saying for the exact opposite reason. So you need stability before you need justice. You, if you have stability, your iman will be protected. Chaos is not going to protect your iman. Uh, chaos is not going to protect your wealth. Chaos is not going to protect your your family. Uh, you know your um, your life. Okay, chaos is not going to protect these things. And to say that we're going to overthrow this is to say we're going to bring chaos. So this is the argument with which Sheikh Yusuf Hamza is thinking. Now let me make this even more difficult. The Prophet said, Wasma Listen and obey, even if you dislike them. If a slave runs away from the master, you have to bring the slave back. This is how important acceptance of authority is within the Sharia and within Islam. And the authorities that exist right now in the status quo, this is the reality that you have. You have to deal with the authority as it is today, here and now. It's useless thinking about some big fundamental change, some big paradigm shift, some something like this is why Sheikh Hamza Yusuf is against the idea of Khilaf. Because he believes that, at least at the intellectual level, he believes that stability and accepting reality as it is will bring more fruits than trying to bring a whole new paradigm shift. Now, what does Sheikh Yusuf Qardawi say? You have two giants here now. And I'd like to ask you, what do you think, what, which side I'm on in this whole thing? I'm going to give you another dalil. Even though this dalil is not strong, but it makes my point. Because this is an Israeliat dalil. Ibrahim wasalam, married Sarah. He went to Egypt. He married Hajar. Hajar and Sarah couldn't get along according to the Israeliats. But I'm making the point here. So this is, it's not about the authenticity. Hajar moved away from Sarah. This is why her name is Hajar. Haj, Haj, she did Hijra away from her. This is one way to look at it. Or she did Hijra to Mecca. This is the other way to look at it. So she moved away from Sarah. But she had a dream to go back to Sarah, her master, who she, you know, because she was in Egypt, she was a princess, she chose to be with the family of Ibrahim, and she entered into the family of Ibrahim as a, as a servant of, she chose to be a servant of Sarah. And then when she ran away from her master, she was told to go back. So this is how important, this is the importance of listening and obeying the authorities that are over you. So this is Sheikh Yusuf, Hamza, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and his teachers' view of how they look at Maqasid al-Sharia and how they look at the issue of Khilafa and how they look at the issue of the status quo and 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 how to protect the five basic fundamentals of Maqasid al-Sharia. Sheikh Yusuf Qardawi, on the other hand, 
Now you have these five things. Sheikh Nusufur Qardawi has also two. So over there is we need stability and then with stability we can then bring about some justice using the institutions that already exist. Sheikh Yusuf Qardawi says, may Allah protect him, he, he feels, and he's been criticized for this idea, but he feels that before anything, it's because he's dealing with the Arab world, right? So he's dealing with the Arab world, and in that context, he's talking about his context, now remember, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf has been brought into the Arab world specifically to counter the opinions of Sheikh Yusuf Qardawi. So keep this in mind. Regarding this issue specifically, because Sheikh Yusuf Qardawi says the first thing you need, even before Sharia, even before Islam, even before justice, is you need freedom. You need freedom from these institutions that take away our freedom. And Sheikh Yusuf Qadawi is saying that these institutions that take away our freedom are a threat to our life. They are a threat to our aql. Okay? They are a threat to our wealth. They are a threat to our, uh, our genes even. Okay? They are a threat to our, uh, to us in every way. And because they are a threat, the only way out of this threat is to first have freedom from these dictatorial, imperialistic institutions, and when we have freedom from these institutions, then we will be in a position, because the Sharia is the one that's guaranteeing these five aspects of Sharia, so therefore, we will then move towards teaching the people, educating the people, doing tarbiyah, that they would want Islam, and they would then want Islam to protect these five at five maqasid of sharia of islam for them meaning they would want khilafa because khilafa's purpose is from a fiqhi perspective is to protect these five things the islamic state would protect these five things at all costs the life of a person the aql of a person the the nasab of a person the wealth of a person the iman of the person sheikh yusuf Gadawi is saying the current institutions are threatening your iman the current institutions are threatening your wealth. The current institutions are threatening your aql with, with even the television and the programming and the indecency and all this that's going on. It's a threat to your, your life, especially if you're a scholar, you're in jail. Okay. It's a threat to, uh, your wealth because if you speak out or do anything, it's a threat to your aql. If you speak out against the kings, they'll throw you in jail. You don't have freedom. You don't have freedom of press. You don't have freedom of voice. You know, what? look at what happened to the Ikhwan after the elections in Egypt. So this system has to be removed. Without that freedom, you will not be able to have that stability that that Sheikh Hamza Yusuf is talking about. So Sheikh Yusuf Qardawi believes that you need the freedom before you need, before you can even implement Sharia. You have to free yourself from this tyranny that is a threat to the maqasid of Sharia. Okay, and when you have freed yourself from this tyranny, only then you will be able to be in a position to use your aql, to use your deen, to actually properly make the judgment of what do you want as Muslims. And then the voice of the Muslims will be heard. So when the companions of the Prophet, now over there I told you how important obedience to authority is. You know, one of the uh, problems in the modern times today is that we don't like to obey authority. And people don't, anything of, of authority is disliked. Husbands are let, disliked because w women are told to be there. Uh, governments are disliked because citizens are told to obey them. Teachers are disliked. Parents are disliked because children are told. So this whole paradigm of going against the people in authority and the people that have, that are the very ones that bring you stability, this Sheikh Hamza Yusuf considers it wrong. On the other hand, Sheikh Yusuf Qadawi is saying that when, when these very institutions that are supposed to be protecting your life, your aql, your iman, your wealth, when they are in place, then it is our job to seek freedom from them so that then after that freedom, then we can implement the Sharia and bring about justice. So you see that now over there I mentioned the uh, listening to the authority and the sayings of the Prophet about listening to the authority. Now let me bring the counter hadith references and 
the Quranic references in this case. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sahih Bukhari mentions this when the Prophet was asked, you know, about rebelling against the authority, right? The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, إِلَّا أَن تَرَى كُفْرًا بَوَهْمًا Unless you see clear kufr. And when they stop praying, if you have reasonable proof that they do not pray, they do not come to the masjid, they're not leading the Jummah khutbahs anymore, they're not involved with the citizens of the Muslim world, right? When they are no longer and when they are showing clear kufr, then you are allowed to rebel against them. This is the hadith in Sayyid Bukhari. So now the issue is, how do you balance the sayings of the Prophet? You have to obey them, even if you dislike them, you have to have patience, versus you, when can you be allowed to rebel against them and replace that? So let's say if there's a movement in Saudi Arabia today, and it stands up and says, we will not accept this, we want the kingship to come down, or... Somebody stands up in Egypt against Sisi, General Sisi, and says, we will not stand against this. The military comes in, and there's so much bloodshed, and people die, and there's no result anyway. Well, why? Why do that? Why do that? Same thing in Saudi Arabia. It's just going to lead to more problems, and there will be no result. So what to do? So this is now the debate that is taking place you can say at the in the intellectual world where scholars who have taken one side or the other one group of scholars want the stability want the status quo and the other group of scholars they don't want this they don't want the status quo they want the status quo to change and they feel that the status quo is a threat to them so now you will understand that when uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf spoke uh, about the cops and about the police, about Black Lives Matter, he was looking at it from the perspective of his general idea of, you know, we just dislike authority. So cops are generally good people. They're in authority. We should have respect for them. They're in authority. We don't want civil unrest. We want stability. And we have to use the institutions as they are. So even this idea that, you know, of the Black Panthers and Malcolm X and kind of like revolutionary ideas, he's not really very keen about that. Okay, so when you have an impasse like that, what to do? Who to follow? Where to go? This is where Imam Shafi becomes very interesting. Look, Imam Shafi's clear answer to this would be, let's go back to the original. Instead of using these tools that we've created and extrapolated from the text, and we're lost in the world of these tools, maybe we should just go back to the text. Interesting. And so here's my answer. And then you can give your two cents, I'll give my two cents, and let's continue this discussion. And that is that if you go back to the original text of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, and if you look at the seerah of the Prophet, how he went from Mecca, how he went to Medina, how he overthrew the Quraysh, right? Then it becomes clear, to me at least, without any shadow of a doubt, that in this particular debate, Shaykh Yusuf Qardawi has the upper hand. Because I don't believe if anyone actually understands, like this is my fiqh al -waqir. If you actually understand what the institutions today represent, you would see that how much they are of a threat to any religion, to anyone's iman, to anyone's wealth with this fake paper money, to anyone's aql with all the drugs and the TV and the shows and all the things out there to distract us and to make us ADHD where we can't have, you know, even five minutes of attention span, uh, where, our, uh, where we're being manipulated at a level where we have never been manipulated before, it is absolutely important to either disengage, completely get off the grid at one level as much as you can to get off the grid, or to change the grid. And these are the only two solutions Muslims have if they want to protect their future generations if they really know what's going on. So this is my two cents on this issue, that you have to work for a, for becoming a jama'ah, being with a jama'ah, being with an amir, 
being with the bear, having the bear, following the model of Imam Mahdi, following the model of Imam Mahdi. That is the future. The Khilafah, the paradigm change is the future, and this is what the Prophet told us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is where I stand on the issue, that's my two cents. I would like to know what is your feeling and your thoughts on this issue. Okay? All right, Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullah. Make sure to subscribe today and make sure you like and make sure you leave your comments and ideas. Zakumullah Khairan, Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullah. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله